Good morning and welcome to Clayton Valley Presbyterian Church on this, the 5th of July. Um, in announcements, as always, we have our coffee hour after church, our evening prayer service, and our Thursday Bible study. If you're interested in joining any of that, please let me know. Please remember to turn in your pledge money to send a check to the church. Um, it, it is being collected. If you are a visitor, we welcome your donations as well. You can go to our website and use PayPal or send in a check. We continue with our adoptive family with Samira and Arash um, and are hoping to celebrate the presence of a new baby within the month. I think that's it for announcements for now. Let us know, let the office know if you have any needs and we will be more than happy to uh, address them and figure out how to get you the help you need. Please take a moment to center yourself, to become present in this place and let us begin worship with our call to worship. And these are the words of God. I will go before you and level the mountains. I will give you the treasures of darkness that you may know that it is I, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. I call you by your name. I am God and there is no other. From the rising of the sun and from the west, I am God and there is no other. These are the words of God. Let us worship God together. Please join me in the unison prayer confessing our need for God's grace. We give thanks, merciful God, that in Christ you seek to unite all things in heaven and on earth and to reconcile all people to one another and to you. Yes, we know that the new creation is not yet complete in us and that we feel everywhere the barriers that separate humankind. Help us and fill us with your spirit of oneness. Reveal to us those places where pride, insecurity, fear, or selfishness build walls once torn down in Christ. Through the power of your spirit. Amen. now the celebration of God's grace. Know that God is there to help us tear down dividing walls 
and to call us into unity and communion with one another. Thanks be to God for that grace and that strength. Amen. for Joanna as she recovers from surgery and moves into chemotherapy for her cancer. God in your grace, hear our, our prayers. prayers. Continued prayers for the residents of Kirker Court. God in your grace, hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. Prayers for Vicki B. God in your grace, hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. For Karen Mangini who is recovering from a stroke. God in your grace, Hear our, our prayers. prayers. For Tom's niece in New York in an apartment. God in your grace. Hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. For Sharon's sister, whose co-teacher at her school died this week. God in your grace. Hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. For Rugsy's brother, Ronald, who is in the hospital and who probably will not make it. God in your grace. Hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. For Megan, recovering from seizures. God in your grace, hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. Prayers of joy for Joe's brother who gets to celebrate the 4th of July with his family. God in your grace, hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. For this day we give thanks for freedom and for liberty and for times to celebrate together as a community and as a country. We give you thanks for uh, God for opportunities to remember that we are all connected and that you are the God of all nations as well. So on this, the 5th of July, I invite you to lift up whatever prayers are on your hearts and minds as we come together in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for being the God of all people. We give you thanks for this place in which we live, and times to celebrate the country that we are part of. We also give you thanks that you are the God of all countries and all nations, and that you call us to remember to love our brothers and sisters, our neighbors across the pond, as well as here. We give you thanks for beautiful sunshiny days, for flowers and fireworks, we give you thanks for feasts and parties and celebrations and for quiet times apart. We pray that you would give us strength to continue to do what we must to keep safe in this time of virus, in this time of distance. We ask that you would give us the strength to stand up against injustices and to speak truth where truth needs to be spoken. We give you thanks for this community and for all those lives that each person in this community touches. Help us to remember truly that we are united in you. For we pray all of this using the prayer your son taught us. Our Father, who is in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And finally, we finish our study of the book of Job today by reading Job 41, verse 1 to 8, and Job 42, verse 1 through 17. Can you draw out Leviathan with a hook, restrain his tongue with a rope? Can you put a cord through his nose, pierce his jaw with a barb? Will he beg you at length or speak gentle words to you? Will he make a pact with you so that you will take him as a permanent slave? Can you play with him like a bird, put a leash on him for your girls? Will merchants sell him? Will they divide him among traders? Can you fill his hide with darts, his head with a fishing spear? Should you lay your hand on him, you would never remember the battle. Job answered God, I know you can do anything. No plan of yours can be opposed successfully. You said, who is this darkening counsel without knowledge? I have indeed spoken about things I didn't understand, wonders beyond my comprehension. You said, listen and I will speak. I will question you and you will inform me. My ears had heard about you, but now my eyes behold you. Therefore I relent and find comfort on us, dust and ashes. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, he said to Eliphaz from Teman, I am angry at you and your two friends because you have not spoken about me correctly, as did my servant Job. So now take seven bulls and seven rams, go to my servant Job, and prepare an entirely burnt offering for yourselves. Job, my servant, will pray for you, and I will act favorably by not making fools of you because you didn't speak correctly, as did my servant Job. Eliphaz from Teman, Bildad from Shewa, and Zophar from Nehemah did what the Lord told them, and the Lord acted favorably toward Job. Then the Lord Job changed Job's fortune when he prayed for his friends, and the Lord doubled all Job's earlier possessions. All his brothers, sisters, and acquaintances came to him and ate food with him in his house. They comforted and consoled him concerning all the disaster that had been brought on him, and each one gave him a casita and a gold ring. Then the Lord blessed Job's later days more than his former ones. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. He named one Jemima, a second Keziah, and a third Karen Hapuk. No women in all the land were as beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father gave an inheritance to them along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw four generations of his children. Then Job died old and satisfied. The New Testament reading today is from Matthew 11. 16 to 19, and 25 to 30, and I'll be reading from the Common English Bible. To what will I compare this generation? It is like a child sitting in the marketplace, calling out to others, we played the flute for you, and you didn't dance. We sang a funeral song, and you didn't mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. Yet the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunk, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved to be right by her works. Continue on with verse 25. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have shown them to be babies. Indeed, Father, this brings you happiness. My Father has handed all things over to me. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son wants to reveal him. Come to me, 
all you who are struggling hard and carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Put on my yoke and learn from me. I'm gentle and humble, and you will find rest for yourselves. My yoke is easy to bear, and my burden is light. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So today we end the book of Job, and as you heard, it's sort of a fairy tale ending. You know, everything goes wrong, and then everything goes right, and he's rewarded, and they all live happily ever after. And I know at some level that that might be frustrating, but what I want to focus on today is that there is a lot in this passage, and a lot that is worthwhile for us to explore. Um, and that starts, again, with the entire arc of the story, and so I want to review that for a little bit. As you may remember, the very first week that we talked about Job, I mentioned that um, the word is actually accuser. It's not Satan. It's not opponent. It's, it's accuser. The accuser comes and basically says to God, you know, Job is doing all these things right, but he's not doing them right for the right reasons. He's doing them because he believes that good actions will earn him good things. So it's an exchange for him. It's a trade. You know, I'll be good to you, I'll do what you want me to do, and in exchange you'll bless me. And the accuser and God with him agrees that this is not the right reason to be doing good. That that is not what life is. Life is not fair, for one thing. Um, so the, the idea that you do good things in order to earn good things doesn't really work. But we know that, that that is, in fact, what Job thought and what Job's friends thought. They, they deeply and truly believed that you get rewarded for good behavior with good things. And this whole book of Job confronts that. Job clearly states here, especially in this passage that we read today, his attack on Job's friends is because they are saying that. Job's friends say over and over and over, well, you must have done something to deserve this. And God is saying they are mistaken, greatly mistaken. So today, again, we, we discussed that before, that you know, life is not fair, and we discussed that. So today what I want to focus on more is the second problem with just being good in order to get what we want. And I want to start by asking you why you think most people, or why even you yourselves, are faithful. Why is it that you come to this place, even from afar, even from virtually, even on your phones or your computers or your tablets? Why are you here? Why are you faithful? Why do you strive to do what is good and right and just? We know that for a lot of Christians, the answer to that is heaven insurance. You know, if, if I do right, and if I come to church, and if I am faithful, then I'll be rewarded with heaven. And again, what this passage or the whole book of Job is pointing out is that's not the way it works. But I would say that even people who don't, are not aiming for heaven still believe that this is true here on earth. We believe if we do right and good, we will be rewarded, and if we don't, we will be punished. And again, we would like life to be fair, we would like this to be the way of the world, but it is not the way of the world. But still, even those people who are thoughtful and thinking people, we still tend to gravitate towards this thinking. We blame poor people for being poor. We assume that they are lazy. We assume that if somebody has been killed, it's because they deserve it. We are sometimes cruel in the way that we attack people who are already down. We assume that if you are imprisoned, or enslaved, or killed, or suffering, that you must have done something to deserve it. We do. We assume this. And it is unkind and unfair, and as Job tells us, it is also wrong. 
It's just wrong. The rain falls on the just and the unjust alike, as Jesus himself tells us. And the truth is, we become complicit with evil when we try to justify it happening and fail to call it for what it is. I understand why we do this. We want to have control over our own lives. And we want to be able to take credit for the good things that we have. I think it's both those things. We want to have control and we want to be able to take credit. And so if we can say, I have what I have because I earned it. I have what I have because I deserve it. And those people who don't have it, well, they just don't deserve it. They're less than. They haven't done right. They're not good. Then we have a sense of control. Well, if they just behaved better, then they'd be fine. So that's the control. But also the, I don't have to owe to the world anything. I don't owe to the world anything. I don't owe to my country anything. I don't owe the world anything. Because I've done it all myself. I earned it. I deserved it. And again, what we get from the book of Job is not true. And more than that, it's, it's, not about, it's not then about being faithful in the right way. When we are here, it's not about genuine faith. It's about an exchange of goods. It's about trade. And what the book of Job says is not only is this not the right way to be faithful, but it's also a sign of not being the good person that you say you are. That's what the accuser was saying about Job. You know, he's not really good, he's just trying to get what he wants. And that's not acceptable to either God or the accuser. I think about um, the times in my life as a pastor that I have had someone come to me, and I hear about these stories a lot too, and they're begging, begging, begging for an experience of the divine, whatever that is. And they, they're begging for this experience of God's presence and God's um, love. And they're saying, I've done everything right to get it. I have, I've done good. I've served people. I've come to church. I do this and I this. And I, I'm not experiencing God. I'm not feeling God. I'm not seeing God. And what I want to say to you is two things. One, experience of God is grace. It's not something we can ever earn or get. It's grace. But the second thing is what does bring those things, and you're not going to like this, <laughs> but everybody I know who has had real and genuine experience as of God have never come from being or doing good. They've come without exception, in my experience, from suffering. No, not a fun thing to hear. It's not that I think God creates suffering. I don't believe that, as I've said. Rain falls on the just and unjust alike. I think that's a, uh, that that comes from free will, not from God. But I do think that God is still creating, and God is still present, and God is still active. And what that means is that God is creating out of chaos, and that God is resurrecting out of death, and God is renewing out of suffering, again, out of pain. And I know that's hard to hear, but as Richard Rohr says, transformation, and that transformation is what allows us to see God where we haven't before. Transformation takes place in only two ways, either through great love or great suffering. Suffering has many gifts with it. And again, I would not wish suffering on anybody, and I don't think God does either. But it does have great gifts with it. It brings humility. Again, as I said, this, this idea that we've somehow earned everything that we have, that quickly gets dispelled with when we suffer. So it teaches us humility. It helps us to grow, and it helps us to empathize with others who are struggling. Finally, suffering shows us who we really are. How do we respond to pain? Do we respond by increasing in compassion and empathy, or do we respond with anger? And that really tells us who we are, so that suffering is a gift. Job's suffering and lament, as I discussed last week, was, was the focus of my sermon last week. Job's suffering and lament allowed him to see God. So again, 
That is what leads to those moments that people ask about all the time and want for themselves. It's that suffering. It was only through his suffering that he actually changed from being a man who really was thinking only about himself. He was being good so that he could get what he wanted. And he was doing, being faithful so he could get what he wanted. He was doing everything right, but he was doing it to get what he wanted. Again, it was this trade idea. And his suffering transformed him from that person into someone who actively sought real relationship with God. But more than that, it opened his eyes to see the beauty of creation. The scriptures that we read in which God is describing what God has done, it's incredible. It's very poetic, and I encourage you to go back and read those scriptures. Just the beauty of creation. Job's suffering broke him open so that the light could come in. It broke him open so that the light could come in and so that his vision would be opened into being able to see majesty and awe and wonder and beauty and God all around him. I think about... um, in a lot of ways, the story of of Jacob, which to me, in a lot of ways, is even clearer about this than the story of Job. So I want to read you that this morning. Um, This is Genesis 32, 22 through 32. That night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants and his 11 sons, and crossed the ford of Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Job's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, What is your name? Jacob, he said. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Then he blessed him there. You may not know this, but the very word Israel means one who struggles with God. In other words, the the place of the beginning of what is our faith, too. The beginning of the faith of Jews and Christians and Muslims. For all of us, the beginning of our faith is this wrestling, this struggling with God. So much so that the place of that beginning is named struggles with God. And what is that struggle? It is two things. It is suffering, and it is relationship. It is suffering, and it is relationship. And those two things broke open Jacob and broke open Job to see and experience God. Which brings us back to my first point, which is, why then should we really have faith? Why should we go to church? I think about what Jesus asked his disciples in John 6, 67. He said, do you also want to leave? To which Simon Peter responded, Lord, where would we go? The disciples' love for Jesus was so great that they could not imagine being anyplace else except with him. We get this. I can't imagine wanting to be any place else except with my children, with my family. Our love for one another is so great that we want to be with one another. Even when we are you know, connected virtually, it's so important that we connect. And that is why we should choose to be here. And that is why we should choose to have faith. And that is why we should choose to be in relationship with God and with one another. 
Job's reasons for his actions changed completely through his suffering from being one of this exchange barter thing, I'll do what you want and then ex in exchange I expect you to give me what I want, to being I am with you because I love you and I want this relationship from you. And because of that, I now see you everywhere around. His suffering broke him open. I want to make one final point about Job. Again, Job never receives an answer about why people suffer. He's never given that answer. Instead, he is shown a God who suffers with him, who is present with him even in his suffering, and a God who loves him so much that that God will work with him to overcome that suffering and to bring all good things about. God is still creating, and God will still create until the world is at peace and justice has come. God is still speaking, as the UCC people say, but it's true, and God continues. God will continue to bring beauty out of chaos and new vision out of our suffering. So our call to faith, our call to relationship with God should be about our love of God and our actions of caring for one another and caring for the world and caring for community should be expressions of our gratitude for a God who loves us into being and loves us into relationship and calls us to be with one another and with God. Not out of guilt, not out of buying something, not out of bartering, not out of trying to get what we want, but simply and purely out of love and gratitude. I know that all people here have suffered, and I want to say to you I'm sorry, and I think God is sorry Two, that is that you have experienced pain. But I invite you to use those times to be open. Someone said to me this week that the darkness of this time is not the darkness of the tomb, but the darkness of the womb. And so we should respond in kind by breathing and pushing. And what they meant was pushing for good change, pushing for justice, pushing for love and compassion to truly reign in our lives and in the lives of those around us. That is what God does. Pain leads to new life, and God is with us all in all of it. Amen. I invite you to think about ways in which you can give back to God's world, God's creation, God's people. And as you consider that, I invite you to join me in our prayer offering ourselves and our gifts back to God. For the gifts of all good things, we give you thanks. For opportunities to learn and grow, we give you thanks. For differences and variety, we give you thanks. Help us to use all that you have given us so that we may be bearers of your love to the world. Amen.
ocean and sunlight beams on clover leaf and pine. But other lands have sunlight too and clover and skies are everywhere as blue as mine. So hear my prayer Today is a communion Sunday, so um, I would invite you now to go to pause the video and go get yourself a piece of bread and a cup of juice or wine to celebrate with us and then begin again. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right to give our thanks and praise. Gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for this meal, for this time together, even when we are apart, for the sharing of bread and cup that reminds us that we are united, even when we are separate, that your love for all people unites us across the world, that you are the God who brought all people out of slavery, that you are the God who returns the exiles home, and you are the God who frees us from our own shame and guilt and pain. You are the God who sets us free from angry thoughts, from hating thoughts. You are the God who creates in us new life. So as we take this bread and cup, let us remember that you are God of the ordinary and that you are present in these things, making them sacred and holy for us. That your presence calls us to be grateful and out of that gratitude to be your people acting with love and compassion in the world. Help us to be fed by this meal and by this time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. On the night of his arrest, Jesus took the bread and after giving thanks, he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. All of you take of it and in doing so, remember me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he poured it out, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant, the cup of new life. All of you take of it, and in doing so, remember me, for these are the gifts of God for the people of God, and all are invited to partake. Please pray with me. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this meal. We give you thanks that you are the God who calls us together. We give you thanks that you are with us in all things. Help us to be your people in the world, to be strengthened by this meal, to love and care, to see and hear. We pray all of this as we lift up all the prayers of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Keep your 
Life is short, and we have little time with which to grace the lives of those with whom we travel. So be quick to love, make haste to be kind, go in peace, and may God, Creator Christ, and Holy Spirit be with you and bless you this day and forevermore. Amen.